Good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, for being here. And uh, we're very, very proud and thankful to Brian. Uh, we've, uh, Oliver and I uh, from Saber Wing, uh, made it a priority to be here simply because of the subject matter uh, that, the, that the conference uh, covers. And we think it's very important. Um, even though we're not your traditional sustainable aviation company, uh, there are a lot of things that we still do with an eye on sustainability uh, in order to uh, do what we need to do, so to speak. So um, anyway, just a little bit of background about myself. Uh, I've been in aviation for over 40 years, most of that time in flight test. Uh, I've, uh, I started out in the Air Force. I flew in the Air Force and then later on uh, was a test pilot for various corporations and uh, wound up here. And the way that I wound up here was that uh, I get a frantic call one day from a, a kid, really he's still a kid, he's under 30. Sorry, anybody, in, anybody in here who's under 30, you're, to an old guy like me, you're still a kid. But, uh, but anyway, I get a frantic call and the call was, hey, I know you guys have been working on a heavy lift drone and my company, who happens to be a Chinese drone manufacturer that also made uh, motors, he said, my company is looking for somebody that can build a drone using our motors and do what's called the Pacific Drone Challenge. So that was really the start. As it turned out, the drone company did end up uh, withdrawing because of various reasons, having nothing to do with the Sabre Wing, but they ended up withdrawing, but we remained in it. And so I'll talk a little bit today about that. So, really long title here, it almost looks like my master's dissertation title, um, but, uh, but only missing a few words, but anyway, uh, the, uh, it's, it's basically flying the Pacific, and it's the Pacific Drone Challenge, uh, and really why, what the difference is here with Lindbergh's flight. It's very similar, we've heard several people say, you know, this is a Lindbergh's type uh, event, or a Lindbergh level event, because of the fact that we're flying transoceanic. Um, and that's true, actually, it was a very good observation. So uh, let's start out a little bit, as I mentioned, the Lindbergh Prize, uh, or li what the prize that Lindbergh was, uh, won was called the Ortec Prize. And uh, literally what that was, was to have somebody to f that could fly across the Atlantic from New York to Paris, and that was a whopping $25,000. Uh, and I say whopping, and I'm not saying that in a, in a facetious sort of way, because uh, the Pacific Drone Challenge has no prize. <laughs> Not yet, anyway. The, the prize is really, as we've been told, bragging rights, but really it's more than that. It's the ability to demonstrate, uh, just like in 1927, the, the ability to demonstrate that UAVs can actually fly the distance and, and uh, carry a useful load and do it unmanned. So there are a lot of challenges that weren't around in 1927. And even though a lot of the technological issues have been solved and we're very much in the same place where they are uh, technologically, uh, but only in different uh, regimes. So with that being said, uh, Mr. Orteg, Mr. Raymond Orteg, actually I think it was Dr. Orteg, uh, he said, uh, the stimulus to, uh, to the courageous aviators I desire to offer through, air sp through the auspices and regulations of the Aero Club of America, you know, I should have known this, I say it all the time, uh, a prize of $25,000 to the first aviator, perfect, thank you guys, of any uh, allied country crossing the Atlantic in one flight from Paris to New York or New York to Paris, all other details in your care. And if you look at it, we could almost supplant it with the purpose of the Pacific Drone Challenge. Almost exactly the same thing, except take out the $25,000. So there's Mr. Orteg and the winner of the Orteg Prize. I think everybody knows who this is. It's uh, Donald Trump Sr. No, I'm teasing you. Uh, this is uh, Lindbergh on the left and Mr. Orteg on the, on the right, Dr. Orteg, excuse me. And he went on to say that the prize has occasioned considerable investment in aviation, sometimes many times the value of the prize itself, in advancing public interest and the level of aviation technology. Simply put, it's here to prove the ability of aviation to do, to do the job that we want it to do, to prove to the world that aviation is now out of its infancy. It's out of the, oh, gee, that's really cool, or look at that guy do loop-de-loops, to, okay, let's see what we can do with this now. So as I mentioned, the, uh, the, it, it was to show the future of transportation, 
back in 1919. That's when the prize was founded. So to show the future of aviation. Uh, and it's also to demonstrate then that the state of the art of aviation had progressed to the point to where we could actually, surprisingly, fly across the ocean. Engines had uh, advanced in te technological ability. Uh, the uh, airframes and everything else had reached the point, especially after World War I, which accelerated the development, had reached the point to where now they were being viewed as a serious uh, application. And of course, who led the way, it seems that way throughout history, but who led the way in that uh, pushing the state of the art was the military. But it had more applications, the air aircraft had more applications than just a war vehicle. And so uh, Dr. Ortega saw this and his uh, point was to tell, let people know, hey, we've progressed beyond the point of just using them as a war vehicle. These have practical uh, uses and commercial uses. So uh, he was looking at it more from we can carry people and cargo. And so it sounds a lot today like what we're seeing. We're seeing drones, the first large drones were developed by the military. They progressed almost backwards in a way to the small drones, the Part 107 drones, that were, uh, had the capability of uh, you know, taking pictures and you could fly them up to 400 feet and so on and so forth. But still, that one area here, the commercial use of these air vehicles really, really needed to be demonstrated and the state of the art was there. Um, and then as I mentioned before, uh, to be able to fly mail and cargo and passengers over long distances and routes. That's really the, the point here, the, the division between the part 107 drones, the under 50 pounds, and you know, maybe if you're lucky, 45 minutes to an hour of flight time and you know, a few hours of, of uh, excuse me, a few a hundred feet and a few miles away and really not be on the line of sight. So we've progressed beyond that point. So this is the state of the art of aviation in 1920. Uh, as you can see, these are all supersonic air vehicles. Um, and, and the jets look a little bit different, but uh, but anyway, uh, so this was state of the art. It was a biplane. It was really proven. The technology was proven beyond the shadow of a doubt during World War I. And engines had progressed. Airframes had progressed. And uh, so they were looking at carrying airmail, which they were doing very successfully at this point throughout the United States and other parts of Europe. Uh, just about anywhere that we had a, 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 a stri dirt strip of a couple of thousand feet, we could get one of the converted World War I flyers that had been converted to fly airmail, we could get it in and out of, in, in marginal weather, not, not particularly bad weather, but in marginal weather. So there were a number of successes and a number of barriers in aviation. And by 1927, when Lindbergh actually flew the Atlantic, uh, there had been a few stops and starts. There had been a, quite a number of attempts, actually, to cross the channel, both going from New York to Paris and then Paris back, which... In, in hindsight, going from Paris to New York seems like folly, but at the time it wasn't really, you know, pretty much they had to contend with surface winds, which could be good or bad, but nothing like the, like the jet stream if you can get up above 10,000 or actually even 18,000 feet. <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, there were several attempts. There was tried it at dirigible, uh, and they went from uh, Scotland to Newfoundland, which was big stuff at the time. Um, Multi-engine aircraft flights uh, going from Ireland to Nova, Nova Scotia and then Paris to Ireland, but it really connected the, the dots at that point. And then high endurance flight, this was Chamberlain Acosta, um, which they flew 4,100 miles and 51 plus hours. So really you can see the progression here by 1927 to be, be able to fly that kind of a distance for that kind of period of time was really an incredible feat. The reason they did that, they were going to try for the Ortega Prize, but they wanted to test it over land and verify that they could actually do this with a safe landing uh, zone under them as opposed to having to land on a liquid runway. <clears throat> so this was, uh, this was a very big feat for the time. And everybody, the odds-on favorite were with Chamberlain Acosta. Everybody thought, you know what, these guys are going to do it. Uh, they were, at the speeds they're flying at, they'll be able to reach Paris in no time. They'll be there well before the 51 hours. And then there were other issues. They didn't have radio communications that w in, in any wide use. There, was, there were some radios, but they were still tube radios, so they weren't really talking to air traffic control. <clears throat> uh, satellite navigation, GPS, that was unheard of at the time. So their satellite navigation was basically a sextant. Um, they took a, what they call a cell shot or a celestial shot, and, uh, and that's the way they found their way. 
Um, and then, of course, accurate weather forecasting, still very much in its infancy. They kind of had an idea, but they didn't have a chain of weather stations or even weather satellites, so they couldn't see what was out there and couldn't see what was coming. They kind of had an idea, but, you know, again, it's, it was a, still a very uh, uh, unreliable forecasting method, kind of like what it is now. Um, and paved runways, as I said before, there were a few, but for the most part, uh, even Le Bourget and the field where uh, Lindbergh took off, they were all unpaved. They were basically cow pastures. And so that's how they got in the air. Uh, the other thing, too, is air traffic. Not a lot of air traffic going across the Atlantic. <clears throat> if that had been the case, they would have been able to uh, fly a lot earlier. But at those altitudes, at the altitudes that they flew, especially for those distances, you had local air traffic. And then again, it was very, very sparse, uh, even for local air traffic. And finally, uh, FAA-type regulations. At the time, of course, it was NACA, but um, I said, regulations, what regulations? Basically, there were very few. There wasn't a, a, an organizing agency that said, you know what, you have to have 9G seats in the spirit of St. Louis. You have to have a 30-minute reserve uh, or 45-minute reserve. Uh, you can only fly at this altitude going eastbound. Those kinds of regulations really didn't exist at the time. They had one or two little, they didn't even have regulations for seat belts. So you can imagine that the, the state of regulations at that time, um, it was kind of the Wild West as far as being able to get an aircraft in the air and fly it basically anywhere you wanted to go. So d degree of Olympic uh, difficulty, this was definitely a 10. Even though people were trying it and they were building up and had actually lots of time that they could fly in the air, being able to go from one point on the United States side in, the, in, the, uh, in New York to all the way to Paris was a huge, monumental leap. Uh, and I, as I mentioned before, even though motors and airframes were up to the task, <clears throat> we had nothing but dead reckoning, uh, no clearance for air traffic. So if there was air traffic in the air, you had the Mark I eyeball that was really your detect and avoid sensor to keep you away from other traffic. Uh, no flight plan. You didn't have to tell anybody where you were going because there was nobody that was there, even if you did. Uh, the ones that really cared were the newspapers because that was our main news. It's like would be like us calling up CNN and saying, oh, we're, we're leaving from Japan. So uh, that would be about the only thing that was available at the time. Uh, air con as I mentioned before, no control towers, no air traffic control, so not a lot of communication, uh, unreliable weather forecasting, and uh, of course, fuels and engine technologies. Fuels, they were still uh, kind of in their infancy, but they'd come a long way to be able to do this. So they were still unknowns, though, for the most part. Okay. So where are we today, 2018? Uh, how do we compare? Well, in reality, in 100 years that have gone by, there are a lot of similarities, but a lot of changes, obviously. 100 years and the technology that we've developed in 100 years is huge. Uh, we have reliable electric propulsion, which at the time it was an internal combustion engine, which in actuality we do use. We're, the air vehicle that we use is a gas electric hybrid. It's, a, uh, it's designed to fly uh, long distances, and, it, uh, and I'll talk about it a little bit more, but it's designed to, to go from point A to point B with the highest uh, fuel fraction that we can, uh, that, that's available today. Uh, we use composites, uh, as almost everybody else does, uh, for a stronger, lighter airframe, uh, and then we have other technologies that help us to fly faster, higher, and with greater accuracy, things like GPS and WAS, inertial measurement units, uh, detect a specific detect and avoid system for this aircraft, uh, satellite-based command and control, uh, NEXRAD-based weather, which is satellite-based weather that's available to just about every pilot uh, today. Um, and then, of course, we also have air traffic control that will help us clear uh, under a, an instrument flight plan, help us to clear uh, traffic. So what is the Pacific Drone Challenge? I keep talking about that and leaving guys in the dark, but what it is is we're to, we are flying from the Sendai UAV test range in northern Japan to Moffett Field in the Silicon Valley. And that's by Great Circle route, that's 4,472 miles, or as we say, 4,500 miles. Uh, the, uh, some of the restrictions are that you can't use a rocket or a balloon or any type of airship, uh, those are not allowed. Uh, it also has to be nonstop and unrefueled. Uh, it uh, has to take off with a payload of greater than 50 pounds, so it can't be a, a part 107 
uh, aircraft or air vehicle. Uh, it has to conform to FAA regulations, and there are specific regulations. We are going to be flying under an experimental certificate, uh, which has its own uh, regu specific regulations, but it's going to be very, very similar to the type of aircraft that we are going to build uh, commercially. Uh, we must file the flight plan. There's a reason for that. We're going to be flying at 18, above 18,000 feet, which is Class A airspace. So by FAA standards, actually international standards, all of those, anything flying above 18,000 has to have a flight plan, has to be under positive control by air traffic control. And then uh, uh, we are going to be also under the auspices of a drone racing authority. Um, we haven't quite uh, reached, or I should say the Pacific Drone Challenge itself hasn't reached an agreement, but uh, we are hoping to make that announcement sometime around the first uh, week of June as to who that authority is. But it's more than anything else, they're the sanctioning authority. Uh, really quick side note was we were at the uh, Uber Elevate uh, Summit and we were able to speak to uh, Peter Diamandis, who's the originator of the X Prize. And one of the things that he said, unprompted by either Oliver or me, was I'm actually thinking about putting together an X Prize to fly a drone at high altitude for a long period of time at a high speed. And I said, what do you mean by high speed? He says, greater than 100 knots. And I got a big smile on my face and I said, then I absolutely need to talk to you. <laughs> so there is a possibility that uh, they're thinking along those same lines, the same lines that we are. And we, don't, we have, haven't really had a chance to discuss since we got back. That was just on Thursday was the last day, or excuse me, Wednesday. But, uh, but I think that there is a lot of interest there, which is actually evidenced by the fact that everywhere we've gone so far to talk to people about the Pacific Drone Challenge, the room has been almost packed. People are really interested in this. Uh, again, the degree of difficulty, how is it now compared to 2010? So whereas we had very sparsely populated air lanes, we have very densely populated air lanes now, even in places you wouldn't imagine. Even in transoceanic routes, you get a lot of 747s and everything else. Uh, you, like I said, you're also required to have a flight plan. Um, uh, the weather over the Pacific tends to be worse, actually, at, that, at, the time, at almost any time of the year, it tends to be worse than the North Atlantic. So nothing to, it's not to denigrate Lindbergh, they do have bad weather there. It just seems like the bad weather over the Pacific tends to be a lot more, uh, or I should say a lot more frequent. <clears throat> There's a longer distance between landfall. There's Newfoundland to Ireland is a couple thousand miles, but for us, the landfall <clears throat> is 4,500 miles. You have, we still are required to constantly communicate with air traffic control, so that means if the satellite communication goes down, um, uh, we have to still be able to air, uh, speak to air traffic control to clear the aircraft and to uh, provide position reports. Uh, well, there's no pilot on board, so that's one of the main differences with 1927 is there's no pilot on board. Actually, the pilots are on the ground. <clears throat> but in doing so, it means that we have to have an autonomous system on board that will detect and avoid any other traffic, any unseen traffic, and even birds for that matter. We have to be able to steer completely clear of them. Um, and of course, fuel if efficiency is very important today, <clears throat> which means right now state-of-the-art for batteries is, is not to the point to where we can yet fly transatlantically or transoceanically, I should say. So what our solution is, is a gas electric hybrid. Um, and we actually use a motor that's very, very efficient, an internal combustion motor that's very efficient. It's so efficient that it actually beats California emission standards. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry about that, it's allergy season. But anyway, um, we actually conform to California emissions and, uh, and are able to uh, fly that. When battery technology does come around, we hope to retrofit our air vehicles with batteries, but for the time being, it is going to be a gas electric hybrid. Um, and then as I say, in contrast is regulations, where I said before, regulations, what regulations? Now, here are the regulations. Quite a few, as I mentioned before. We have flying under an experimental certificate. We have to meet very minimum basics and standards, and then some upgraded basics, or I should say uh, upgraded standards like detect and avoid, and the ability to talk to air traffic control, no matter where the air vehicle is. <clears throat> uh, so as I mentioned, the uh, gas electric hybrid meets California standards. We use four ducted fans. Uh, why? Because we are a VTOL air vehicle. We can take off and land vertically. And this was the promise of aviation since time immemorial was to be able to take off and land just like a bird in any location, take off from any location, land in any location. 
That's our vision, is to be able to realize that promise. Saberwing wants to do that and be the first company providing a cargo aircraft that can take off and land in any location. <clears throat> Uh, we have five patents pending just on the air vehicle alone, and actually now that we uh, are deep into development, we have other patents that we're applying for, so we have more IP. And we are also have the capability of using biodiesel or green fuels, uh, including green jet fuel, algae-based jet fuel, things of that nature. <clears throat> uh, we also have the most advanced detect and avoid uh, beyond line of sight operation. It's a three-pronged detect and avoid. I don't have the time to explain it here, but I, I can talk to you more about it later. It's so advanced that we, you can, we can detect a hummingbird at a certain distance. <clears throat> We're able to cruise uh, from Japan to the United States at 21,000 feet. In reality, over the ocean, nobody wants to cruise that low, none of the commercial carriers, for a good reason. There's a jet stream there. There's a slight one at 21,000, but it keeps us out of congested airspace as well. And we're able to fly very fast. 180 knots is our cruise, but we have the capability of flying up to 200 knots uh, if we need to. Well, our pilots are on the ground and not in the air. Um, all command, control, and communication are done via continuous satellite link. We have a ground station uh, backup uh, when it's over land, so if we should happen to lose any kind of communications, we still do have a ground-based station. Um, and then we still have a low baud capability that just gives us aircraft position. We, the flight plan's already uh, internal to the uh, air vehicle, and uh, it's loaded into the autopilot, and it can fly and continue a flight plan without uh, having to communicate directly with ATC. But we will always know where the aircraft is. Um, and then we'll have pilots located at both the launch point and at a separate central uh, mission control element. So, connection to modern day history, um, the Orteg Prize was to fly at uh, UAV at high altitude. Modern day Orteg Prize is to fly uh, UAV at high altitude, fly the UAV at high speed, and fly a UAV for a long period of time. What this is for, it's to prove that the UAV is no longer in the toy realm or just in the realm of the military. So it uh, has a number of capabilities. <laughs> Sustainability, as I mentioned before, we have the internal combustion engine that conforms to California emissions requirements, actually better. Um, can use biodiesel or ethanol. We use a FADEC to uh, fuel uh, in order to keep the emissions low, uh, but keep the efficiency high. And higher combustion temp temperatures within the ICE mean that we reduce NOx and eliminate, eliminate CO completely. Uh, it's more economical to operate. Electric motors last for thousands of hours, so they don't require replacement, um, and doesn't require any heavy loading equipment at any site. So there's no trampling of the environment. There's no fuel required in order to unload and, and load and unload ours. This is a quick uh, look at the, our development partners. These are the people that are actually helping us to develop this uh, and helping us on the uh, Pacific Drone Challenge. A number of these corporations are actually multi-billion dollar corporations, Tencate, Euroavionics, um, and uh, a few others, Cobham, uh, all very, very large companies that are invested in improving that technology. Finally, really quickly, this is about a 20, 30 second video uh, of the air vehicle. And uh, this is at the Ted Stevens Airport. Um, as much as I'd like to tell you that this is the real thing flying, this is actually animation, unfortunately, at this point. But, uh, but we have had people look at this and say, you guys are flying. Yes, we are, on a, on a computer graphic. Anyway, uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. That Thank was you. fascinating. And I've always been an enthusiast for technology prizes, and I hope this one comes to pass. Thank you. What uh, stood out for me is that your airplane is capable of vertical flight and that the uh, requirements for vertical flight are tough in their effect upon long-range flight. And so is it the intent that the Trans-Pacific Challenge will require a VTOL kind of landing capability in addition to the 4,500-mile range, or will conventional uh, runway rolling type aircraft be allowed in the competition? That's a very good question. Uh, we on our side are pushing for VTOL, <laughs> but uh, the rulemaking so far has just been, uh, yeah, we can use a conventional aircraft or conventional type takeoff and landing. Uh, we'd actually like to see at least one, but most of the people that have uh, expressed interest don't, are not looking at VTOL at all. So 
Uh, like I said, as much as I'd like to push for it to be completely VTOL, or at least one portion of it, the landing or the takeoff, uh, right now that is, has not been made into a rule yet. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Um, you mentioned a, a three-prong approach towards detect and avoid, right. and that you don't have time to talk about all three. Could you talk <laughs> about one or two? Certainly. So it's a three-prong three, three prong based system. It's uh, the first leg of that is the uh, ADSB system. Uh, and hopefully by the time we fly, we'll be able to have the ADSB next, which is satellite based. And, uh, but if not, we're still ADSB equipped uh, we, and we will have clearing by ATC. So that's the first prong. The second is a vision system based on, let me back up a second here. Uh, Okay, there we go. So, uh, based on a company by, that's called Iris Automation, and they make a camera vision-based system that builds a 360-degree bubble around the air vehicle, uh, and so it's able to detect uh, objects out to 1.5 kilometers. Uh, at the speeds we travel, that's still enough time for us, plenty of time actually, to detect and avoid. It's very accurate. It can not only detect uh, obstacles in the air, um, but it can also be used to fly at low altitude, so anything on the ground would, would also fall into that. And then finally, the other one is a point-based LIDAR system that's made by Atolo. Uh, it builds a 270-degree uh, point cloud uh, in front of the air vehicle, and it's good out to about 600 feet, so it's very fast reaction. It's anything that may come within 600 feet of the aircraft, and it will autonomously allow the aircraft to, to avoid traffic. Thanks. You're welcome. Any other? When's first flight? First flight, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, we're actually looking at uh, hoping for first quarter of 2019. We're, we're, in the old days, we used to say we're actually bending metal now, but you, we're bending composites now. <laughs> but, uh, but we're actually laying up composites. Uh, some of the things that we're doing is this is an example of the air vehicle uh, minus the nacelles, but in saying that, uh, this is a carbon fiber 3D printer that we have. We're going to build actual structural components out of this, uh, things like uh, bulkheads and joiners. And, so it's very lightweight and allows us to quick, to rapid build and prototype. So we're uh, able to move along quite quickly. So it's probably about the first quarter of 2019. I, I want to be September of 2018, but uh, the chief technology officer is about to throw something at me for saying that. But... Uh, Anyway, <laughs> other questions? You can say where you are and ask a question, that's fine. I, I'll repeat it for the cameras. Anything else? Okay. Oh, yes, hi, Susan. That's actually good to know because uh, we'd love to enter that, even though we're not all electric, but uh, we're a hybrid, but would love to be a part of that. Go ahead, sorry. Excuse me. Uh, okay. Could you come and, and state the question into the microphone? Oh, I yeah. think that's a very important topic that everyone wants to know about. So I'll repeat it now, what you said, and then you can c continue with your second question. But yeah, c come up ahead. It's, it's okay. not really a question, but it's a comment on the right. 1919. Uh, by the way, my name is Susan Ying, and I'm from Ampair. And um, so in Australia, Northern Territory, they have this offer for a prize again. And it's uh, in commemorating for the 1919, the great race. Uh, by the way, in 1919, there were uh, the two teams actually completed the whole race from, I think one of the airplanes was in your picture for the right. 1919, that biplane thing. And the shortest uh, time it took for the, the, the number one team that won right. took one month and the number two team that won, because many were dead for that, yeah, that's true. For that race. <laughs> and the number two team that won took two years. Uh, so it's a big spread. But anyway, uh, they're offering this uh, uh, race again, electric airplane race in uh, 2019, next year. And so uh, we did a little calculation for this. So the uh, lowest requirement that your electric airplane would have to fly will be around 300 nautical miles in order to cross some of the uh, waters. And that's actually a very good point. There were a lot of, you know, as I mentioned, successes and failures. Um, 
but the uh, most recently, if you look at the Solar Impulse, they were they flew around the world in a solar powered aircraft uh, with electric motors, and it took them two years to do it. So again, that's one of it's. It's, it demonstrates the capability of solar to be able to do that, but we're still a, a long way of, away from being able to, to, to move cargo at a long distance. Um, but, but it's coming. It's, it's there. And, the, it, and also, I'm actually a consultant for Ampere. Um, Ampere does a, uh, they're building an electric, all electric aircraft to retrofit specifically aircraft like the Caravan. Um, the Cessna Caravan. So they're looking at the heavy cargo as well, and a really good uh, uh, group of people there, but they're making a lot of progress, and they're getting ready to, to put together their demonstrator aircraft. Um, and that's actually, Susan and I were, are working on that currently. So, um, yes, sir. I'm curious as to what sphere of financial reward or future gain when this, this sort of technology becomes commercialized. I mean, right now, Given unlimited taxpayer money, there's already one aircraft that could probably meet the challenge now, which is Global Hawk, but it costs billions of dollars. What sort of financial frame are you looking at? A very good point. Uh, so we, we, that's, people have mentioned that before. Oh, you're flying to Japan, from Japan to the U.S. You know, Global Hawk went to uh, Melbourne and back, which is true. But uh, the Unless you've got a billion dollar paycheck or a bank account, the Global Hawk probably isn't gonna work. And they're not really made for cargo, quite frankly. They'll carry a big radar, carry it really well, but they're not really made, made, made for cargo. Uh, and we've also heard too from various sources that the, the General Atomics is getting ready to do a redesign on the Predator to carry cargo. Uh, not sure where they're gonna carry it, but certainly I think there's, there, a lot of people are now starting to see the capability we actually have done market studies, and we see the need for uh, autonomous air cargo of this of the class that we're building, the, what we call the Wyvern class. Uh, we're an all-dragon shop, so and our operation here at Hayward is called the Dragon Works. But anyway, uh, the Wyvern itself, uh, we see about 3,000 units between now and 2030, and that's just including the manned routes. We are opening up a whole new section because we're able to take off and land from just about anywhere in, in the world. Um, and fly two tons of cargo to that location. So that being the case, uh, it actually opens up. Nobody's really sure. They think 3,000 units of the, of the manned variety, it could be double or even triple that because we have the capability of going places that no one else does. So it could be, it, being conservative, maybe 4,500 units to 6,000 units between now and 2030. So that was a very good question, by the way. Um, so unless you've got the money... Yeah. Thank you.